When most people think of proclaiming the gospel, they picture a minister speaking on a Sunday morning or perhaps a Wednesday night. There's a church, usually a pulpit of one kind or another, a congregation or viewing audience if the sermon happens to be televised, and the hopefully spirit-appointed and anointed minister sharing eternal truths from the Word of God. Hello, I'm Eric Holmberg, your host for Ghost and Speak, the Forgotten Power of the Public Proclamation of the Gospel. And I'm standing in just such a pulpit and in just such a church. This particular sanctuary was built over 200 years ago and has been rebuilt twice. And among the ministers who have preached here was Edward Mackenzie Bounds, or E.M. Bounds as he's better known. Edward Mackenzie Bounds, E.M. Bounds as, as we know him, was a remarkable young lawyer who in the Third Great Awakening, um, a series of Brush Arbor revivals in his native state of Missouri, came to faith in Christ in a dramatic way and became convinced of a call to ministry. Bounds' life and his ministry were interrupted by the American Civil War. And he gathered the names of all of the boys that had been converted under his ministry in the field, and he went and visited as many of the families as he could to tell the families of their son's courage before their death. And then he came back to Franklin and determined that uh, he would minister to the shattered remnants of this town. He became the pastor of the little Methodist church and there became renowned for his practice of prayer. He, he, would, he would rise at four in the morning and, uh, and cry out to God uh, for the next four hours, um, seeking the outpouring of God's spirit and a renewal in the town. But while prayer is Bound's most well-known and celebrated legacy, he was renowned in his time also for his preaching, sometimes doing so from another sanctuary, like where I'm standing right here at the center of town in Franklin, Tennessee. But no, there was never a church building here. The sanctuary he used in these instances wasn't made by human hands. You see, Ian Bounds, like so many great men of God before him, believed in the out of doors, public proclamation of the gospel. Uh, naturally, the Brush Arbor uh, revivals, the, the Third Great Awakening, was, uh, was largely a phenomenon of outdoor preaching. He was a product of that. As a result, that was his orientation uh, even to local church life. He became the pastor of a small Methodist church. But like so many in the Methodist tradition, he loved the proclamation of the gospel outdoors. All of his heroes were people like um, uh, Asbury and Gideon Blackburn, who traveled across the American wilderness and pioneered new churches. Uh, Blackburn, it's estimated, planted 43 churches on his way from the Hanover Presbytery of Virginia to Tennessee and then beyond. He, um, he, he founded schools and, and ultimately was, was one of the founders of what today is the University of Tennessee. Um, primarily through outdoor preaching. So Ian Bounds grew up with that. As a young pastor in Missouri, he practiced it. Bounds' life and his ministry were interrupted by the American Civil War. Uh, um, amazingly, he wound up in the midst of a prisoner exchange with the Confederacy in Memphis, Tennessee, now here's this Union guy, he's got brothers fighting for the Union Army, he's got Union sympathies, he's anti-slavery, he winds up in a prisoner exchange and he finds himself in the midst of a bunch of Confederates and his response to that was, God is sovereign, he must be calling me to serve here. So he becomes a chaplain in the Confederate Army. And now he begins to practice once again what he's been reared in, that old Methodist tradition of preaching in the open air. Most Christians know that the word gospel, which is euangelion in the original Greek, the word means the good news. But in the first century, when the gospel was first being proclaimed from town to town and city to city by the followers of Jesus, the word also carried with it a military and political connotation as well. When Peter and John are sent out from Jerusalem by the Apostolic Congress, or when Philip the Evangelist goes out from Azotus to Caesarea, they go from town to town, 
They go to the synagogues, but not just to the synagogues. They go to the public square. They go to the same place that the heralds would have gone to announce big news, uh, a great military victory, or a change in rule, or a new Caesar. And that's the original meaning of the word, euangelion, is it's the proclamation of good news, i.e., we won a big battle, or there is a new person in charge. So in the place where someone would say, uh, Julius Caesar is Lord, or Nero is Lord, Philip, John, Peter stood up on the, the stone block and said, Jesus is Lord. Christians ever since have been doing that same thing. The first proclamation of the gospel is in the public space, and then the church throughout history has always made the proclamation of the gospel in a public place a central part of its mission because it challenges, it is a challenge and a proclamation to everyone. It is good news to everyone. It's a, a, the proclamation of an event that has implications for everyone. It has changed the world and everyone needs to hear about it. So, as in Acts chapter 8, when Peter and John were sent by the Apostolic Congress in Jerusalem to present the gospel to villages throughout Samaria, or when Philip left Azotus and preached the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea, they weren't going only from synagogue to synagogue at the invitation of the local rabbi. Often there was no invitation at all. And even more often, their declarations that men everywhere needed to repent and yield their lives to the true Lord of both heaven and earth were delivered in the same places the Roman heralds used when announcing the ascension of a new Caesar to the throne town squares, markets, arenas, and major as well as minor thoroughfares, wherever people congregated so that as many as possible could hear the eulangalia, the good news, publicly, out of doors, and as they say, in your face, the early Christians and faithful followers of Christ ever since were, in the words of the Apostle Paul, not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. In this video, we're going to examine this power. This means that God has appointed to save men and transform cultures, particularly as it relates to presenting the gospel in the same places, the highways and byways, as the early church. We'll begin where the Christian worldview should always be forged, with the Word of God. Does the Bible support and even command that we take the gospel to our neighbors and to the streets? Next, we'll look at how God has used this means throughout church history. Then we'll examine the present, how and why this basic tool of the Great Commission has been largely ignored, answering common objections and misunderstandings in the process. And then we'll conclude with how you can find and fulfill your part in the prime directive given to us by our Lord. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Speak out, and you must not be seen with me. Carry out our plan to take Ione out of Pompeii immediately. This city has gone mad. You have gone mad. There's nothing you can do in God's name. In God's name, I must try. How long have I done nothing? But well, they killed our brothers and stood silent when they said I was a Christian. Would you throw away your life? But throw it away. But give it. No. If I must. No. Let me throw. Please. To be a Christian means to belong to Christ to have a new heart and nature grafted into us by the Holy Spirit through the work of Jesus' cross, resurrection, and enthronement as the Lord of heaven and earth. Along with that comes the joyous responsibility and privilege to follow, serve, and obey Him. And how do we know what it is we're to obey? Well, as every true Christian knows, the first and best guide to knowing God's will is the Bible. 
If the Lord declares in it to jump, our only response should be, how high? Has God called every Christian to evangelize the lost? Well, we may just as well ask, is every Christian called to love his neighbor as himself? You know, the answer to me is obvious in the asking. We're all to love our neighbor. Share the gospel with those who are yet in darkness, which is just another way, perhaps, maybe it's a more important way of, of loving them. Uh, I personally believe that the world we live in would be a very, very different place if every Christian loved, prayed for, uh, shared their faith with the lost, and then supported the work of those who are called to full-time missions and evangelizing. Now, there are many ways to evangelize, including supporting those who are called to the Ephesians 4.11 office of an evangelist. But we have to be on guard against the zeitgeist, the spirit of our age, and its proclivities towards reductionism, individualism, moral relativism, and a host of other isms which tend to ignore, trivialize, and even reject one of the most fundamental, organic, and historically effective methods for reaching the lost and standing prophetically against the celebration of sin, that being, of course, open-air preaching. But before we consider this zeitgeist and the resistance it has spawned towards the purposes of God, let's put first things first. Does the Bible support the public proclamation of the gospel? We cannot reject the plain teaching of the Great Commission, go and teach all nations, go and preach the gospel to every creature. Wisdom calls aloud outside. Notice the key word is not inside, but outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the opening of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. In Isaiah, where uh, Isaiah was saying, you know, here am I, send me. And God said, go, tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. God's telling us that we're, we're commanded to go out. If we've truly had uh, an encounter with these, these seraphim and God's robe filling the temple and our our lips, um, you know, our, our lips being um, touched with that hot coal and our sin being purged and taken away. It, it's just, it's, it's absolutely, utterly uh, 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 just a, an overflowing of what God has saved us from and, and what we want to go tell others about to go and share this message by, by standing up in the open air and, and preaching it. I look through the Old Testament and I see that Jeremiah was an open air preacher. Isaiah, Amos, Jonah, they were all open-air preachers. And even Jesus said in uh, Matthew 10, 27, he said to, to all the apostles, what I tell you in the dark, tell people in the light from every rooftop to preach what I tell you in the dark. Well, the, the public proclamation of the gospel has been a vital part of the spread of Christianity from the first centuries. You know, you can look at the apostles and Paul and as they carried the gospel, you know, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, into Greece, uh, into the, uh, Europe, it was that public proclamation that was a vital part of, of that. Well, the first scripture would be, for me, uh, Romans 10, where it says, How shall they hear without a preacher? And um, often Romans is uh, said to be a treatise of salvation but I think it's better understood as an apologetic for missions mm. and world evangelization. And therefore, uh, Paul is very pointedly telling us that people will only hear the gospel and only receive Christ, and the world will only ever be evangelized if preachers are sent by the body of Christ to tell them. What Paul says is that we need to go out and be ministers as though Christ is making an appeal as though God is making an appeal through us. And that word in the Greek is a very strong word. It's almost like begging. God is almost is begging people to come to Him through us. And I know that's kind of hard for some of us that are so, you know, we're, we're so rooted in the sovereignty of God. But guess what? God wants us to go beg people to come to Christ. 1 Corinthians uh, one twenty one, where it talked about that the foolishness of preaching pleased God, that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. It pleased God to go out and proclaim 
the gospel, God's means to save the lost. You know, and we have so many intellectuals, and he says, where, you know, uh, he, he's talking to all the intellectuals at the time, where's the scribes, and where's the debaters, and where are all these people that seem to know everything, because to, the, to humanity, to humanity in and of itself, um, the gospel's foolishness, but it's the wisdom of God, it, because it's God's way, and uh, whether man agrees with it or not, it's the wisdom of God. I think we need to recognize that, first of all, our Lord Jesus Christ preached in open air. All of the apostles whose epistles we've got in the New Testament preached in the open air. Everyone, the Apostle Peter, Apostle John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, everyone that you want to mention in the New Testament, all the names you know, they all preached in open air, they preached in marketplaces, they preached where the people were. Given the clear biblical mandate to take the gospel of the kingdom to the very people who need to hear about the king, we must ask ourselves, why is it so little done, or worse, even despised? If we're to recover the forgotten power of the public proclamation of the gospel, we need to be aware of and actively repent of and resist the deceptions that war against it. Number one, as is often the case with matters concerning the human heart, is pride. The first world, with its unprecedented freedoms and prosperity, has fallen prey to precisely what God, through Moses, warned the Israelites, that they would forget who made them prosperous, become proud, pseudo-sophisticated, and increasingly lacking in their first love and simple devotion to God. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which I command you today, lest, when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Once this happens, vain imaginations begin to multiply. The worldly philosophies that Paul warned us to reject proliferate, and suddenly the wisdom of this world, what God calls foolish, begins to look wise. While the true wisdom that God has sent to confound the worldly wise, the gospel begins to seem foolish. Given its profound repercussions, this is one of the great sins of our time and is worth considering in more detail. Let's look at the entire passage in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians that describes this great dichotomy. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. These verses describe three kinds of people, Jews, Greeks or Gentiles, and Christians. To break this down and apply it to our world today, we're looking at first the religiously observant, people who outwardly honor God, but whose traditions cause them to reject the message of the cross as a stumbling block. And then we have the Gentile secularists, those whose epistemology, their theory of knowledge and truth, is rooted firmly in human reasoning and its interaction with the material world. For them, the notion of original sin, eternal judgment, and propitiation through a naked, bruised Messiah nailed to a tree 
not to mention a dead man coming back to life, is the height of superstitious nonsense. The heart of New Testament theology, invented after Jesus' death, is St. Paul's nasty sadomasochistic doctrine of atonement for original sin. If God wanted to forgive our sins, why not just forgive them? Who is God trying to impress? Presumably himself, since he is judge and jury, as well as execution victim. He had to come down here and uh, suffer and die on the cross, so with his blood, our sins would be washed away. Weird, man, I'm telling you. I mean... <laughs> and then there are the redeemed, those who by the grace of God embrace the message of the cross as the very glory and saving power of God. We are called to proclaim a gospel simply, clearly, boldly. And we'll also, we ought to realize this, that uh, election's not the deepest doctrine in the Bible. The gospel, crucified son of God, resurrected from the dead, is the deepest doctrine ever. And we need to communicate that. When, when I get up and preach the gospel, I want to explain to them the nature of God. He is just, and that is our greatest problem. He is good, and that is our greatest problem. Because He is just, He must judge us, and we are wicked. His justice must be satisfied. How can that be done? It can only be done through the death of His Son. When Christ died on that tree, He satisfied justice. He appeased the wrath of God, and it made it possible for God to demonstrate mercy and still be just. And then call men to repentance. I call men to repentance and faith. But here's the rub. When the salt and light in a once Christianized culture declines in saltiness and wattage, bloodless religion and vain man-made philosophies, the Jewish and Greek perspectives Paul noted in 1 Corinthians, become more popular. Gradually, all but the most on-fire Christians find themselves seduced to one degree or another by the spirit of the age. Moral, philosophical, and theological relativism mushrooms the gospel gets watered down. Sin no longer seems utterly sinful. Self-help solutions proliferate. And the need to radically pronounce the gospel of the kingdom tends to get lost and seem increasingly foolish amid all the sound, fury, and fog of a culture at war with God. And an important corollary to all of this a decline in the belief in hell. You know, from my experience, the vast majority of people think they're good people, that God accepts them just as they are, and that hell, if it exists, is only for people like uh, Hitler or Bernie Madoff. Now, that's bad enough. But what's worse is how many Christians implicitly believe the same thing. They, 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 they don't seem to really believe that there are literally people all around them who are just one heartbeat away from the grave and a certain judgment that'll end with them being cast in the lake of fire. Oh, they might believe it in some theoretical way, like they believe in angels, but it's obvious from the way they live their lives that the belief has little or no real bearing on them, which really means from a biblical perspective that they don't believe it at all. Once human depravity, sin, repentance, and salvation in Christ alone is watered down, and the love and mercy of God is emphasized to the exclusion of His holiness, the fear of God is progressively lost. As well, of course, the ultimate focus of that healthy, holy fear. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so for many, if not most Christians, the urgency for warning people to flee this wrath to come just dissolves away. The passion and perseverance that drives believers that take the gospel to the streets is lost. As for the unbeliever, the loss of the fear of God has led to the most extraordinary thing. A growing number of people who shamelessly and very publicly identify themselves with hell, Satan, demons, sin, and a virulent antichrist spirit. That our culture has become so dark and demonic that this level of depravity dares to show its face in public is one of the church's greatest badges of shame. When the meat goes bad, when the meat, 
becomes rotten and maggots form on it, we shouldn't blame the meat. The fault is with the salt. And when the light dims, those deeds which were once done only in darkness are now done publicly. Another cause for the decline in street preaching addresses one of the most common reservations many people have about it, that it intrudes on the privacy of the individual. Much of what lies behind this objection is what we can call the cult of individualization, the unbiblical idea that all men are islands and have a sacred right to believe and do with their island whatever they want. Don't settle for anything less than you can be. Make your life a masterpiece. It was, in a sense, the triumph of the self. It was the triumph of a certain self-indulgence, a view that everything in the world and all moral judgment was appropriately viewed through the lens of personal satisfaction. Indeed, the ultimate ending point of that logic is that there is no society. There is only a bunch of individual people uh, making individual choices to promote their own individual well-being. Capitalism developed a whole industry at developing products that evoke a larger sense of self. That, that, um, that seemed to agree with us that the self was infinite, that you could be anything you wanted to be, that, that took our philosophy and agreed with it, and then created products that supposedly helped you, AIDS, that helped you be this limitless self. Nothing happens until you decide. It is the decision that drives all else. And once you purely decide something, and, and put all of your will into that, you can make things happen. It is indeed the concept of conscious evolution. I choose this future. We have to be mindful with every single thought that we have every single day. How do we want to create our heaven or our hell? How do we treat one another? Because we are the source of everything within us. The ancient Vedic text known as the Bhagavad Gita states that man should discover his own reality, not thwart himself, for he has himself as his only friend or as his only enemy. But if he rejects his own reality, the self will war against him. So I figure I should just try to live right and worship you in my own way. Homer, it's a deal. And this is particularly true in America, where the pioneering spirit and can-do, pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps pragmatism has only added fuel to this cult. Individualism is the American cult. I mean, the frontier defined us, and the, the individual against nature, the individual against society has always been a part of our history. But it has been a little bit cultish. The individual, in biblical terms, is important. Every individual is of value. But there is a humanistic tendency to elevate the individual too far. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, there is no such thing as an autonomous individual. That was a, an 18th century assumption. In some ways, it's led us astray. Nobody is an autonomous individual. Everyone is a part of a family. Uh, and the family is really the building block of culture and society, not the individual. So we do need to resist uh, the overreaching desires of government, but at the same time we have to recognize that God designed us, hardwired us, to be a part of a family and a part of a community. There is a part of our human nature, a part of our being in the image of God, that is only fulfilled in relationship to others. God is a relational God. It's no accident then that we in His image are relational as well. And so we have to find the proper role, the proper balance for that, figure out where we fit in. And there is always a war between two different competing structures, um, between the Bride of Christ and the Whore of Babylon. Um, we need to find our place in the right community. A contributing factor to this cult of individualization, believe it or not, technology. The unintended consequences of technology are one of the most overlooked aspects of our modern world. For example, most people today view the idea of teenagers going out on dates by themselves without parental supervision as being as normal as baseball in the spring and football in the fall. But the fact is that this practice, a profoundly unbiblical one by the way, was almost unheard of until the invention of the automobile. In the same way, Climate-controlled offices, cars, and homes 
which have all but eliminated the existence or at least the use of front porches, the explosion of suburbs, televisions, and personal entertainment devices, among many other things, have so fed the notion that each person is an island unto themselves that the very idea of standing on a street corner or in front of a courthouse and confronting people with the truth upon which their very lives and eternal destinies hang seems as anachronistic as trying to tell the time with a sundial. The solution to all these modern obstacles? As the great 8th century Celtic evangel Boniface, one of the greatest street preachers of all time, declared, let us stand fast in what is right and prepare our souls for trial. Let us neither be dogs that do not bark, nor silent onlookers, nor paid servants who run away before the wolf. Instead, where the battle rages, let us find ourselves. Run towards the roar of the lion. Run towards the roar of the battle. This is where Christ's most glorious victories shall be won. We must return to our first love. Embrace the cross, repent of fear and intimidation before man-made methodologies and technologies. We must strengthen the things that remain and return to the first works. There's no substitution for the simple, straight up proclamation of the gospel, shouting it from the housetops. There are few examples of the impact of open-air preaching in changing hearts and even an entire culture more powerful than the testimony of the 5th century Christian Telemachus. He was a monk from the eastern part of the Roman Empire, a man who chose to live a life dedicated to prayer and self-denial. In 404, in the year of our Lord, Telemachus made a pilgrimage to the west, arriving for the first time in Rome. There in the streets he heard the sounds of the gladiatorial games and went to investigate. The Christian classic Fox's Book of Martyrs describes what happened next. A rudely clad robed figure appeared for a moment among the audience and then boldly leapt into the arena. He was seen to be a man of rough but imposing presence, bareheaded and with sun-brown face. Without hesitating an instant, he advanced on two gladiators engaged in a life or death struggle. Laying his hand on each one of them, he sternly reproved them for shedding innocent blood. Posterity records that Telemachus then turned to the vast audience and with a strong voice resounding through the deep enclosure, pled with them in the name of Christ to repent for their wickedness. Angry cries and shouts erupted from the people, the gladiators whose very lives he had tried to save turned on him with their swords. Furious spectators threw stones or whatever missiles were handy at his bleeding form, and thus the brave monk perished in the midst of the arena. His death, however, was far from in vain, for as many people gazed upon his broken body, a spirit of conviction gripped their hearts. Suddenly, supernaturally, they understood that they had become as hideous as their entertainment. Rising to their feet, thousands left the games, never to return. And as if to seal the sacrifice, the Emperor Honorius, when informed of the monk's death, numbered him among the victorious martyrs and issued an imperial decree that put a final end to the impious spectacle of people watching death for sport. So ended the life of one man who chose to boldly shout the truth from the housetops and so began a new manifestation of God's kingdom in the earth. We live in a time when any talk of God, what it means to follow and obey Him, some would even say her, and how to go to be with Him after death is fogged over with the myriad of diverse opinions and novel religious traditions. Who are you? Bruce, I'm God. 
When you leave this building, you will be endowed with all my powers. If you could be God for one week, what would you do? Perhaps a majority, and this would include many professing Christians, embrace or at least default into some form of deism. Yes, there's a God, they would say, but he essentially transcends our world. Having cranked up the universe in the beginning, he now watches everything when he takes the time to bother from a long, long way off. Where's God in all this? Oh, he's up there, somewhere, shouting down that he loves us, wondering why we can't hear him. The man upstairs, as many call him, is a kind, avuncular, semi-detached Santa Claus type who knows who's been naughty or nice, but whose sliding scale of naughtiness means that in the end, only the truly terrible, an Adolf Hitler or a Jeffrey Dahmer, will be left outside when God opens up the pearly gates of heaven. I offer this prayer of peace to the cosmic oneness that is our birthright. A growing minority in the West leans more towards pantheism, the notion that rather than transcending our world, God is one with it, manifestly eminent, the world's soul, the spirit that is in and moves through everything. You can call that God, only it's a different kind of God from the one that's in the Bible, because this God is one that's inside the universe rather than outside. Good and evil are difficult to account for in this system, if all is God and everything is one, how can any two things truly be in opposition to one another? Over and against both of these potent and pervasive belief systems stands Christianity and its elder brother, Judaism. Yes, God is transcendent, having eternally existed and been the prime mover that spoke our cosmos into existence. How can he not be anything than completely other in relation to our temporal reality? But at the same time, he is wonderfully and powerfully eminent, having stepped into our world in a variety of ways and times. First, there was the creation of the first man, when God took the dust of the ground, the stuff of our material world, and lovingly, intimately breathed his spirit into it, and Adam became the Lord's image and representative in the earth. Later, God's eminence was manifested in the Shekinah, a visible cloud of glory, that was seen by several individuals and then by the entire nation of Israel during the Exodus. A cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, a cyclone of light and lightning that descended atop Mount Sinai and caused man and animal alike to shrink back in awe. And the Bible said that God, he descended down in a cloud and he stood with Moses and God proclaimed the name of the Lord. So God came down, you see, and God stood with Moses, and God proclaimed the word of God. And this is so powerful, he proclaimed the name of the Lord. So we must remember, anytime we stand up and proclaim the word of God, you know, God must come down. His presence must fall upon us, and he must stand with us, and God must proclaim the word of God through us as his instruments. And then, of course, there was the tabernacle in the wilderness, and later Solomon's temple, where God's presence, again as a Shekinah, was manifest above the mercy seat and in the Holy of Holies. And then, most significant of all, is the Incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Apostle Paul wonderfully invoked this history's greatest event, save the related resurrection and enthronement of the transfigured Son of Man as the absolute Lord of heaven and earth, when he simply called it God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Notice how all-encompassing this passage is. It's not a mystery, it is the mystery, it is God's mystery. It's not some knowledge, it's not some wisdom, it is all knowledge and all wisdom. And then of course, God's eminence, His presence, is wonderfully and powerfully manifest in the Holy Spirit. From brooding over the creation as it was spoken into existence, 
to his presence as the comforter and advocate in the life of each born-again child of God, to his agency in the reordering of this world through the shock wave of the new creation that issued forth from the empty tomb and has been sweeping over the cosmos ever since. But let's close this section by considering two other ways God moves among us that relate specifically and powerfully to the public proclamation of the gospel. We've already considered John 1, that God can be linked to the Word, and Jesus was the Word made flesh, and further that the words that proceed from His mouth both created the cosmos and sustains it. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the Word of His power. There is deep mystery here, developed by many other passages of Scripture that honor God's Word in such a way that we may as well be speaking of God Himself. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Other translations, most notably the King James, actually places the Word of God over and above even His name. Elsewhere, we see the Lord watching over His Word to perform it, sending it forth from His mouth with the assurance that it will accomplish precisely what it declares. Drawing a parallel to the Shekinah, God likens His Word to fire and a hammer that shatters rocks. We're told that the present heavens and earth will pass away, but God's Word, like God Himself, is eternal. On the positive side, Jesus declared that the abiding of God's Word in the hearts of His people somehow authorizes them to pray with an authority that can literally reshape the world. Additionally, it is the primary agent through which God grows and shapes His adopted children into the image of Christ a powerful and cosmos-changing process the Bible calls sanctification. And on the negative side, when God's Word finds no purchase in a human's heart, it divides and conquers, signaling reprobation and eternal damnation. Add it all up and God is very much present in and through His Word, taking the cosmos He created through it and now refashioning it into a new heavens and earth. We live in the midst of this time, the pilot project God inaugurated when He thundered, Come forth to the greater Lazarus, and the Son of Man became the firstborn from the dead, the firstfruits over and above this new creation. And it is by His Word, carried on the breath of the Spirit, that all this new creation takes place declaring the Lordship of Christ, redeeming souls, righting wrongs, prophesying against sin and injustice, imparting faith and hope. Confidence in the power of the Word of God that I learned very early in that experience that if I am quoting Scripture, God says no word from God shall be void of power and believing that God could take one verse of Scripture and fasten it on the conscience of people. I was thankful that very early in my preaching experience on the street corner because often uh, there would be just a few minutes when you had to try to fasten something and to believe that the Word of God was powerful, quick, sharper than any two-edged sword. God does great things. And the more we cut ourselves away from the strength of the flesh, from the arm of the flesh, the more He is going to do great things through us. We can count on that. We can count on it. You go into a place, you preach faithfully, you preach long enough, somebody's coming out of there saved. Somebody. I think we tend to underestimate God's Word. We underestimate, when we, we toss that phrase around in Christian circles, God's Word is eternal. God's Word is powerful. God's Word is effectual. God's Word will outlast the heavens and the earth. It's by His Word that the world is transformed. It's by His Word that His people are conformed to the image of His Son and made into the Bride of Christ. It's by His Word that the kingdom is established, a new kingdom 
the old will pass away, a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and his people will be the bride of Christ all by the power of his word. Finally, God is present in and through his people. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Before he temporarily stepped out of this world, Jesus assured his disciples that all power in both heaven and earth now belong solely to him. But before they were to go into all the world, publicly proclaiming the good news that the cosmos had a new king, he cautioned them to go and wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came on them in power. Most believers are somewhat familiar with what happened in the upper room, where the first Christians waited for this promise to be fulfilled. The sound of a mighty rushing wind was suddenly heard, and tongues of fire appeared over each of their heads. But most are not aware of the deeper significance of these rather peculiar events. All of the, the supernatural signs and wonders that are associated with Jesus' death and resurrection point to the larger and the deeper spiritual reality of what Jesus accomplished and our new status in the kingdom, our relationship with God. The veil of the temple being torn is of immense significance. We're no longer separated from the Holy of Holies. There's now a way for us to enter into that. It's a fulfillment of the prophecy of, in Joel, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And God does pour out his spirit. So all of these things symbolically show what Jesus accomplished, what his death and his, his resurrection, the promise of his coming again mean for the individual Christian, and then the giving of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the apostles, uh, the, the tongues of flame resting on their heads, and their ability to communicate in languages that they didn't know. These are all symbols of the new spiritual reality accomplished and ushered in by Jesus, and they occur publicly. They occur before a large crowd, before the crowds gathered in the temple in the courtyard in Jerusalem. And the Christians take that example and wherever they go, as the, as the message spreads, they go to the large public place where the crowds are assembled and make that proclamation. And then what happened and happens to these new temples of the Holy Spirit? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? In Isaiah 59, God, speaking of the time when he establishes his new covenant, declared, This is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forever. The power of this word in the mouths of men to effect dramatic change can be seen as just one example in the life of Jeremiah. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth a fire, and this people would, and the fire shall consume them. Now many would say, yeah, but that was Jeremiah a chosen prophet of the Lord, and a vessel God used to help write the Bible. But I could never be used to declare God's Word in this way. Well, you're absolutely right if we're talking about contributing to the canon of Scripture. The Bible is a finished work and is not to be judged, second-guessed, amended, redacted, or added to. Something that Muhammad, Joseph Smith, and a whole bunch of other false prophets would have done well to heed. 
But when it comes to taking the words of this book and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and in the power and authority of the new covenant, your mouth can be filled with even more fire than Jeremiah experienced. We'll close by remembering the words of our King. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater, and that would include Jeremiah, Isaiah, Moses, and all the other Old Testament saints, than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The least in the kingdom. I would suppose that, by God's grace, I'm at least that. And if you truly love Jesus and have a deep inborn desire to follow and serve him, you are as well. So there's really no excuse, is there? Always remember, it's not you with all this power, but the greater one who is at work in you. We're simply his kingdom ambassadors, and the ministry of reconciliation we have received is a delegated one. He is the one doing the reconciling and the judging. And his word declared over and against the wisdom of this world through what Paul called the foolishness of preaching is the very fire of God in our hearts and mouths and has the power by the Holy Spirit to perform the greatest miracle in the world to resurrect men from the dead. See, if you read when Jesus preached in John chapter 7, in the temple, and, and when Paul preached in the marketplaces, you have questions and objections flying from all over the place. They was a fiery crowd. You, you have some believing, you have some mocking, you have some asking genuine questions, you have some who are asking questions sending you up rabbit trails they're just looking for objections to hide behind some say we'll come and hear you more on these things just through preaching in the streets has made these things come alive to me we now come to the nitty-gritty of open-air preaching the who what where and how and here elements of disagreement can arise among sincere god-fearing practitioners of this noble calling in this respect, it's much like the difficult and at times divisive debates that can arise among pro-life activists. Information over here I'd like to give to you. My wife and I have been involved off and on with street ministry outside of abortion mills for almost 30 years. We've met and worked with all kinds of wonderful Christians from different denominations who have made significant sacrifices of their time, money, and energy on behalf of defending life. But despite their common allegiances to Christ and the grand cause of ending child killing, the differences in method and even message can make for some serious and at times painful disagreements between the various pro-life groups who, like open-air preachers, take their message to the streets. Whether it's differences about the use of signs and graphic imagery, or the way you approach people considering an abortion and what to say, all kinds of disagreements can crop up, in many ways mirroring the different styles and emphases among the advocates of street preaching. Add to this the fact that while the more things change, the more they remain the same, there is, after all, no new thing under the sun, that the idolatry that Paul squared off against in Ephesus is in many respects what we face in our streets today. He really, really gave his life. Now, it reminds me of a man. I don't know if you know this, but there's nine... There is another sense in which city to city, street to street, campus to campus, demographic to demographic, our audience and the culture are ever-changing. This requires that we pray, study, and consider before we go stand and speak, so that our message and method is not only faithful to Scripture,
but it's as tailored to the needs of our listeners as possible. Specific events that address the burning issues of the day, I believe, are tremendous opportunities uh, for the church to take the gospel uh, to the streets. Um, for instance, uh, we do a lot of um, a ministry at abortion mills. Um, now, I'm not a pro-life activist. I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it is this holocaust, it is this sin and crime that gives me the platform uh, to present the gospel truth to people who are in serious need of being delivered from the lie uh, that is destroying children in the image of God. And folks, the soul that sins is a slave of sin. If you can go into an abortion clinic and violate God's law, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, you are a slave to sin. We would do well here to consider an oft-neglected truth that God loves and is as interested in you, the preacher, as he is in the lost sheep he's using you to reach. Salvation is towards the beginning, not the end of God's redemptive purposes. As you labor with Him in figuring out how best to reach your audience, how to best shape your message and the manner in which you're called to present it, God is wonderfully and powerfully at work in you, imparting, for example, some of the infinite subtleties of His wisdom, training you for the real end game, ruling and reigning with Him over the new heavens and earth. Rejoice in this and ever keep it in mind as you prepare and then step out in faith onto the waters of open air preaching. And the false God that many create in their own mind, a God that is not holy, a God that is not righteous, a God that is not just, a God that will just turn a blind eye to sin, a God that's satisfied with people going to church on Sunday and living like hell Monday through Saturday, that God will not condemn you to hell because that God does not exist. He's a figment of people's imagination. Nor can that God save you because he is helpless to save. The only one who can save you is the only God who is alive, and that is Jesus Christ the Lord. But until the king returns and his kingdom arrives in its fullness, we will continue to only see through its reflective lens imperfectly. Biblical orthodoxy, what the Bible teaches, and biblical orthopraxy, the method the Bible prescribes, will thus continue to be debated. Though no one has seen God at any time, the only God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him or revealed Him. That's in the Gospel of John. And a one-size-fits-all approach to any kind of ministry, but particularly one as potentially complex and ever-changing as ministering to random crowds of people in a public venue will ever remain a fool's errand. And so we'll leave you to work through some of the contested issues concerning the man, for example, the necessary degree of Christian maturity and theological training a street preacher should possess, women open air preaching, the calling and sending of the preacher, accountability, among others. The message. You can watch the Passion of the Christ as many times as you like, but God hung naked on that cross. Humiliated shame for you. Wesleyan versus Reform views concerning calling and election, the proper balance between preaching against sin and presenting hope. Paul said this to the Athenians, and I'm saying it to you. Presuppositional versus other apologetical styles. The use of scripture balanced against testimony, humor, anecdotes, and other forms of non canonical proclamations, etc. All right, and Robert represents sin and death. Over here is another guy. What's your name? And the method. The use of signs, printed shirts, amplification, drama, leading people in prayer for salvation, the degree and manner to which the preacher responds to scoffers to name just a few of the issues and tactics over which Christians can and do disagree. We'll provide more information and perspectives on these and other off-debated issues, both now and in the future, on the Go Stand Speak website. But for now, here's a rather general outline that seems to best fall in line with the full counsel of Scripture, as well as the test of time and accumulated wisdom.
When it comes to the ideal qualifications of an open-air preacher, who better to consult than the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, a great defender and practitioner of the public proclamation of the gospel. Spurgeon is like a tonic. When you read Spurgeon, you think, every time you read what he says, you go, wow. And this guy not only was a, an intelligent, uh, succinct Bible teacher that just touched the conscience, this man condescended to not only preach open air, but to encourage and challenge others to do it. The following comes from a tract published by the open air mission he highly endorsed. They suggest that a street preacher possess a good voice, naturalness of manner. You can have a natural speaking voice. I'm now speaking at a very relatively soft tone. I am now speaking at a much more intensive tone, but I'm not raising into a new register. I'm now speaking in my street preaching tone, but I'm still just talking. I haven't gone up here, you see, into something that's qualitatively different. So I think helping men to learn how to modulate their voice so that as much as possible, people feel that you're drawing them in and you're talking to them. You're not pounding them with words. Self-possession, a good knowledge of scripture and of common things, ability to adapt himself to any audience, good illustrative powers, zeal, prudence, and common sense, a large loving heart, sincere belief in all he says, entire dependence on the Holy Spirit for success, a close walk with God by prayer, before we take our message out into the open air, we need to be people of prayer, first of all. We need to be on our knees seeking God's face in the Word of God, fasting, whatever special disciplines we need to do to get ourselves in that mindset that, that we are heavenly minded now. We're there to preach Christ. A consistent walk before men by a holy life. You, you cannot fake uh, a prayer life. You cannot fake renewing your mind in the Word of God. You cannot fake the spirit-filled life, no matter how hard you try. And all things are wrought apart from the integrity of the man and the work of the Spirit of God in his own soul. And that is of utmost importance. We might amplify these points a bit for today's audience by adding a genuine humility before God and men that recognizes one's own sinfulness apart from Christ's saving and sanctifying grace. Understand here though that meek doesn't mean weak. That this there but for the grace of God go I heart attitude doesn't mean that we can't stand boldly and fearlessly against sin. But without this deep humility and dependence upon God, the prophetic can easily degenerate into the pathetic, into a judgmentalism that places a stumbling block before the very people were sent to win. Bad, bad sodomite, turn to the God in heaven who will judge you. This is your wake-up call. I think the best thing to do is use our Lord's example and model yourself not on any preacher of the past, but on how he preached in the open air. And, uh, of course, it says of him that he was full of grace and truth. Um, uh, a bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench. And he was going out to heal the brokenhearted, to set captives free, and to help those who were in need. Accountability, encouragement, and a spiritual safety net through true covenant relationships with other mature Christians. Thick skin in the face of mocking and ridicule and some level of victory over the fear of man. Be prepared for the spirit of fear. If you're gonna open air preach, you're going right into Satan's territory and you're gonna have spiritual warfare like you've never had before. It's not the open air preaching that's hard, it's before the open air preaching. You'll get it every time. You'll feel the spirit of fear come against you and you'll feel discouragement, you'll feel uh, I've had guys say to me, I've, I've skydived and I've jumped out of a plane, you know, 10,000 feet. But that wasn't as scary as the first time I open air preached. And that's because you're not just going against natural fear, you're going against supernatural fear. And so what you've got to do is let courage swallow your fears. So when that fear comes, ignore it. Ignore the legitimate pleasures. 
Take up your cross daily, deny yourself, and think of the fate of the ungodly. I'm horrified at any human being with the same loves and fears and concerns that I have being damned in a place called hell forever. That horrifies me. And so that motivates me to ignore those fears and deny myself legitimate pleasures. On one level, our message is simple, clear, and can be summed up in two words, the gospel. When you are given a background and fullness of the scripture, beginning in the book of Genesis and brought up to the resurrection of Jesus, as your mindset is wrapping around the concept of Messiah, you're going to understand Messiah going back to that beginning, and you're going to see in Jesus what the scripture calls him, the second Adam. You're going to recognize and realize and camp in on Genesis 1, 2, and 3, not as an argument to have about evolution versus creation, but to understand the calling of man as man to rule over the creation, the rebellion of Adam and Eve against God, and the promise of God to come and to send a new Adam who will not only fulfill what the first Adam was supposed to do, but essentially fix the problem. You're going to remember the promise in Genesis 3, 15, given to the serpent, that when God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, you will bruise his heel and you will, he will crush your head. Theologians call that the proto-gospel. There's not a full exposition of what's going to happen there, but it's also the proto-eschaton, that it is the first time we're hearing of how the whole world ends. And we see that those two things are really one and the same. Jesus' death on the cross is part of the story of Jesus' victory over all things. This is what I'm going to be preaching in the byways and the highways. I'm going to be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. And I'm going to hope that God would use me to bring those who were the seed of the serpent into his army as we, the church, the second Eve, created to be a helper to the second Adam, are about the business of exercising dominion over all things. And Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. One of the greatest street preachers ever, the Apostle Paul, also kept it simple when he declared, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The challenge for us, however, is that in Christ, His cross, and the euangelion, the glorious good news that is their summation, lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, that the gospel is a virtual supernova of power, authority, and resurrection transforming life. Something so inexpressibly awesome that even God's own angels are described as stooping down with a passionate longing to comprehend its mysteries. How can we do justice to a message we'll spend all eternity trying to plumb? The fact is, in the context of the streets, we can't, unless we keep it short and as simple as possible, focusing on its broadest strokes, drawing them as large and startling figures. And among these broad strokes, that Christ came and died to save sinners and grant them abundant life, and that the cross is the means, the only means God has provided to make this possible. That God the Word, the Son, who made matter, became matter, and then was unmade on the cross so that we might be remade. That He lived the life we were created to live and then died the death our disobedience deserved that Jesus took on sin, our sin, so that we might be clothed in His righteousness, 
that he became a curse and died unraveling it so that we who are under the curse might now flourish under God's benediction. That he who was the image of the invisible God became the image of the serpent so that we who through sin bore the imprint of the serpent might be recreated in the image of God. That he was forsaken by his father so that we might be adopted and cherished by him. Jesus died so that we might live, and a thousand short sermons could be preached exploring the many aspects of the atonement and the awful but awesome exchange that took place at Calvary. Closely connected to this, that sin is the dark engine of death and hell a violent tearing of the fabric of God's created order, the cancer of all cancers that runs through our blood and bones, that we are inured to its horrors because of our inborn depravity and the blinding seductions of the world, our flesh, and the devil, that the day will come when these deceptions will be lifted and we will see God for who He truly is and our sins and ourselves for what they really are. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And in that day, if our sins remain unatoned for, we will cry for the very mountains to fall upon us, to hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That in a hideous reversal of the most sober, attention-grabbing moment in our present collective experience, men and women will be running into the falling towers of another 911 in the vain hope of hiding from the light of infinite holiness and the terrible realization that they have damned themselves by neglecting, even rejecting, the greatest, most costly gift ever offered them. Street preachers also need to realize this. God raises up preachers to save men. But he also raises up preachers to judge men. We are ministers of life. In a sense, we're ministers of death. To, to, to stand there and preach to people is a terrible thing. Because to some, we will bring about salvation. To others, their judgment will be greater because we were standing there that day crying out to them as a tool to help blind, self-justifying sinners recognize their sin and the insanity of thinking that they're good enough to deserve heaven, we must preach the commandments of God, particularly as developed and applied by Jesus, so that sin might be revealed to them by the Holy Spirit as being utterly sinful. I'm a good person, I guess. Because I'm good. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Good person? I'm a good, I'm practically a good person. It's the story of a man named Grady who liked to grade himself upon a curve. And he found that when compared to others, he wasn't such a perv. Here, the well-used message of clearly preaching the law of God before presenting His grace as developed by preachers and reformers throughout church history and up to the present day is an invaluable model and encouragement in blowing out the lamps and letting in the light of heaven. A good person. We've got to look at ourselves in the mirror of God's Word and the light of God's holiness. And then all these things that have looked so nice in the very dull, dumb, dull candle of our uh, own standards will suddenly, under the searchlight of God's law, be seen to be excruciatingly evil. And we will realize that if we were to get justice, it would be an eternity in hell. Now, until people come to understand the sovereignty of God, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the depravity of man, they won't appreciate the salvation of Christ through the cross. You've got to get to the conscience. And the way to do that is do what Jesus did, is go to the conscience via the commandments. You know it's wrong to steal. You know it's wrong to lie. Remember Paul said in Romans 2, you who say you shall not steal, do you steal? You say you shall not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? So the essence of the message is this. Start off in the natural, so you draw a crowd. 
swing to the spiritual by saying to someone in the crowd, what do you think happens after someone dies? Engage them, get their thoughts, listen to them, and then make sure you do what Jesus did and go through the commandments. Open up the spirituality of the law. It says of the Messiah, he shall magnify the law and make it honorable. And we see this in the Sermon on the Mount. Show lust to be adultery of the heart, hatred to be murder, anger without cause is an offensive to God. If you lie, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Lying is so serious to God, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Go through the commandments, prepare the heart for grace, then preach Christ crucified, redeeming us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Then preach the resurrection, he died for our sins, rose again on the third day, then repentance and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And then say to the person you're talking to and the crowd, do you understand what I've just said? If they say no, say, my fault, let me start again. Because you want to produce a good soil hearer, he who hears and understands. Ethiopian eunuch Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? So it's very important to bring understanding and that's the cross, so that the cross is no longer foolishness to those that are perishing, but they see it as the power of God to salvation. As vital and as inviolable as these broad brushstrokes and large startling figures are, however, they're only one edge of the sword that is the Evangelion. Remember what we learned about the gospel in section one of this video. Jesus came to save sinners, yes, but he also came to inaugurate his kingdom a new creation order that began in seed form when sin and death were conquered on the first day of the week as the once dead new Adam stepped out of his tomb alive. Jesus came to give us this new life and that abundantly. He died and then rose to set the captives free from sin and death. This message of a new king and a new kingdom resonates at a very deep and powerful level, albeit an often unconscious one, with many people, particularly in the areas of the world where the leaven of the gospel has been at work for generations. Witness the respect that Jesus commands among so many people, even his enemies, who frequently invoke his name and reputation to serve their own ends. I was like you, Margit. I thought Jesus came, died on the cross, that Jesus' being here was about his death and dying on the cross, when it really was about him coming to show us how to do it, how to be, yes. to show us the Christ consciousness that he had and that that consciousness abides with all of us. Yes, that's right. Oh, the power in that name, in his blood, in simply presenting the man, his cross and the empty tomb to each individual conscience. Consider, as just one example, the profoundly telling fact that most of the world measures epic time, B.C. and A.D., by the cosmos-changing reality of the Galileans' life and ministry. Even the attempts to revise the scope of redemptive history by substituting B.C.E. and C.E. before Common Era and Common Era in place of before Christ and Anno Domini in the year of our or the Lord seem feeble and may just as well, in fact this would make for a good open air message, be unabbreviated as before the Christian empire or Christ as emperor. Because in the end, that is precisely what the essence of our gospel message really is. The bold announcement to the world that in the words of C.S. Lewis, the rightful king, and in the first century one would have used the term emperor, has landed, you might say, in disguise, and is calling us all to take part in his great campaign of sabotage against the kingdom of darkness. Never forget or underestimate the appeal of genuine freedom. That they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! Amid the growing complexities, insecurities, fears, moral confusion, and addictive behaviors of our modern world, the message of true liberty and authenticity, of the defeat of Sauron and the return to Middle Earth, offered by Jesus and his new creation kingdom, may be one of our most effective tools in piercing hearts and calling home the lost.
God's love has to be the primary force animating our message and all the methods we employ to deliver it. Loving God, His glory, honor, and holiness, and then loving our neighbor as ourselves. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. But as we examine the many methods that love might lead us to employ, consider again the words of Spurgeon. In the streets, a man must from beginning to end be intense, and for that very reason, he must be condensed and concentrated in his thought and utterance. Short sentences of words and short passages of thought are needed for out of doors. Have something to say. Look them in the face. Say what you mean. Put it plainly, boldly, earnestly, courteously, and they will hear you. In the street, a man must keep himself alive and use many illustrations and anecdotes and sprinkle a quaint remark here and there. To dwell long on a point will never do. Reasoning must be brief, clear, and soon done with. The discourse must not be labored or involved. Neither must the second head depend upon the first, for the audience is a changing one, and each point must be complete in itself. The chain of thought must be taken to pieces, and each link melted down and turned into bullets. Come to the point at once, and come there with all your might. It will be very desirable to speak so as to be heard, but there's no use in incessant bawling. The best street preaching is not that which is done at the top of your voice, for it must be impossible to lay the proper emphasis upon telling passages when all along you are shouting with all your might. A quiet, penetrating, conversational style would seem to be the most telling. In their hand, right? Watch, look, watch. Now, what is the message that you guys are delivering? The point of all this is to show you that it's possible for you to be misdirected and right. deceived about what you perceive to be true. And sometimes the most deceived people in the world are those who think that they've got it. Jesus said this. He said to me, on that day. Many people are going to come to me and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and in your name go to church, and in your name wear crosses around our necks, and in your name do this, and he's going to, he's going to look at him and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. You can do the same thing. There's much more we can say here about style, about the dozens of methods people use to draw a crowd, from music, contests, and sketchboards, on and on, to issues dealing with the law handling skeptics, mockers, and drunks, and so on, that there isn't time to explore them all here. The bonus section of this video has a number of useful articles that touch on these subjects. And as mentioned, the Ghost and Speak website will serve as a clearinghouse for materials, testimonies, suggestions, how-to advice, related theological issues, training and apologetical material concerning worldviews, philosophy, and cultural matters all manner of great stuff to help you be an effective witness for Christ. But we close with one last critically important thought. The great reformer John Knox, himself a street preacher and a fearless soldier of Christ, observed, you cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. Jesus Christ is coming again. Untold damage has been done to the cause of Christ as well as the public proclamation of the gospel by people, whether they're well-meaning or not, who give no thought to condemning, judging, and unnecessarily antagonizing and even provoking their supposed audience, setting before them all manner of stumbling blocks rather than just the one God has ordained, Jesus and Him crucified. 
Look, we're not talking about being squishy, nicer than Jesus, seeker-friendly Christians who are afraid to take a stand against sin. But there is a right and a wrong way to do it. We're never to usurp God's authority by judging another person's heart or the status of their soul. We are not Old Testament prophets speaking inspired words under the unction of the Holy Spirit, who can then wade into a crowd like it's Nineveh and call down the wrath of God. The bottom line that should inform both our message and methods as we take the gospel to the highways and byways of our world, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation not condemnation, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I've got a razor here, a Bible here. We'll talk about the Bible in a second. And I'm wondering how many people here would be willing to take $50, 50 bucks right now, to have your, all the hair on your head shaved off by this? How about 100 You, sir, $1,000, $1,000, that's right. But you know what? I've never found anybody that'd be willing to lose their eyesight for any amount of money. But you know what Jesus said in Matthew 9? He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. For it would be better for you to enter into a heaven with one eye than to have both eyes and go into hell. If I want to be so preached at, I'll go to church. I don't want to be hit upside the head by some religious God. Jesus, in the middle of the Feast of the Tabernacles, that's actually the last day, Jesus stands up uninvited. They didn't invite him to preach. They didn't say, Jesus, come and give us a sermon. But he stood up and it says he cried aloud. And he says something like, if any man thirst, let him come to me. And I think that that's, it serves as a good example that Jesus Christ preached not just to those who wanted to hear him. That's the whole reason that he would say in his sermons that he who has ears to hear, let them hear. And he who has eyes to see and ears to hear and heart to respond, they'll come to be healed. But Jesus Christ didn't go to just those who wanted to hear him. Uh, the other reason why I think it's important to preach in the open air is because um, it, it communicates to our hearers that uh, Christianity, the Christian church, um, is not bound up in four walls, but it's out there bringing an urgent message which they need to hear. To say that we shouldn't go out and street preach or we shouldn't go out and witness in the streets is to say that somehow apart from uh, using men as instruments, God must lay something on someone's heart supernaturally, draw them into the church, and then we come into the picture. That is not the way the gospel works. God has chosen to reveal his gospel through men preaching the gospel. If they're not going to come to the church, we have to go to them. I think there is great apostasy in our land. If we look at uh, the modern day church, it's far uh, from being biblical. Uh, we see all kinds of uh, messages that are being preached within these churches that are far from what Scripture teaches. And I believe that that and through that, the enemy has accomplished his goal. And that is why it's important for us to make a way into uh, the modern day church in any fashion that we can to speak some truth uh, to those who are there. It's, it's, it's the greatest way that we can worship God by the proclamation of his son to all nations. I mean, the greatest way we can worship God is not lifting up our hands and just singing but it's going to go out and proclaim his son. I don't know. I mean, it's just all a bunch of words to me. If you really want to showcase your religion, I say live it. Don't use a bunch of rhetoric that just offends people. Actions speak louder than words. Live your Christianity. Don't preach it. Living a holy life is something all Christians must do. We, we must let our light shine so bright that people will see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. However, these good works are designed by God to be confirmation, not necessarily proclamation. See, the proclamation of the gospel 
must be with words because that's how God has designed it. Words are powerful. Um, we see the, uh, the temptation and the fall of man in the Garden of Eden being executed with words from Satan unto damnation. Uh, and we see the redemption of man being initiated with words through the preacher by the power of the Holy Spirit unto salvation. It's how God has chosen to save his people uh, through faith by the hearing of the word of God. It should never be shoved down their throats. It's to be simply proclaimed by the preacher and the power of God will complete the process. And I see, I mean simply, that doesn't mean not boldly, but just the message is simple. It's the gospel and it's to be proclaimed with words. Imagine Jesus Christ. His public ministry reached wide, so did the apostles. Then Christ Jesus was publicly crucified as a wicked man. So you're going to tell me that God had it in his heart to publicly crucify his very own son and then not command the public proclamation of his resurrection? What kind of madness is that? We preach the gospel because it's the only answer to man's dilemma. There is no other way that man can be made right with God outside of Christ Jesus. So we proclaim the gospel because it pleases God, that the gospel be preached because it's means to save sinners. You know, God used the foolishness of preaching to bring about his redemptive work to mankind. So the second point to that, the second fold to that is going out and preaching it is because we've got the answer, and it's the only answer. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way that man can be reconciled back to God. So first is to glorify God and to worship God by the proclamation of his son. And number two, it's the only answer to man's dilemma of sin. It's the only answer, not social reform, not education, but a man's heart must be changed. Their whole view of Christianity is distorted then, because if you can't pick up the Bible and and, and, and fish through any chapter, you're going to see at one point someone's there exalting, you know, the name of the Lord. I mean, you go to, you go to Genesis, you got Noah, you know, you just go, you go through the whole entire Bible. I mean, it's public proclamation. I mean, that's how people hear. That's how people know. Another thing that you need to understand is, like, people will say, well, when, when you preach, you're, you're making people think that you think they're wrong. Yes, exactly. They are wrong. And that's why I'm standing here being laughed at in the middle of this plaza. I wouldn't do it for any other reason. If everyone was right, I wouldn't be here. But the fact is they're wrong. And not only are they wrong, they're terribly and eternally wrong. And I must stop the flow. I must get out here in the middle and stop the flow. The street preachers, even when they're doing the best they can, they're in the will of God, they're filled with the Spirit, they're preaching according to the Word. This world and the contemporary Western church is going to judge them because we have a God of tolerance, um, a God of avoid scandal at all cost. And I hope and pray that street preachers won't give in to that, that they'll realize this is just a part of the scandal and the cross of preaching the cross. Why is it that people just assume that we're not living it? And God help us if we're not. And anyway, proclaiming the gospel on the streets is a vital aspect of living out our faith. A popular Christian quote attributed to Francis of Assisi, you know, the one that goes, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words, has ironically become a cop-out for many Christians, that they feel they don't or shouldn't even proclaim the gospel verbally, but just instead let, let, let their little light shine. But the irony of this is that Francis and the man who joined him at the deserted house near Assisi Forgive and you shall be forgiven. actually spent much of their time wandering through the mountain districts of Umbria, singing songs and making a deep impression on their hearers by, I'm quoting here, their earnest exhortations. In other words, Francis was a street preacher. Well, you know, I don't, I don't think all this talk of sin and judgment and standing before God is really going to pull anybody into this guy's orbit. You know, it's all too judgmental, just mean-spirited. I think he's driving people away from God. And they're quoting usually Matthew chapter 7. And the context of that verse is not judging with hypocritical judgment. Otherwise, in John chapter 7, 24, we would have never been commanded to judge righteous judgment. 
And also in 1 Corinthians 5, we're commanded to judge those who are in the church. But those are outside God judges. So in the sense, all we're doing is proclaiming the judgment of God. The, the misconstrued idea that open-air preachers are harsh, condemning, mean people is obviously wrong because um, you'll talk to any open-air preacher close, close up, you'll really, get, you'll really get to know who they are. And um, you can warn and blow a trumpet and not sound like a trumpet afterwards. I, I wrote an article um, a while back called Hellfire Preachers Needed. And I basically took from the Gospels every single verse about where Jesus preached about hell. And he just didn't teach it. He didn't, just didn't talk about it. He, he preached it to people. Um, um, you know, we know the famous um, passage about the Pharisees when Jesus came to the Pharisees and he just, uh, woe unto you, woe unto you. And he would talk about hell much in that context. The cross of Jesus Christ is about the death of the Son of God who willingly chose not only to come to earth and live as a man, but he chose the actual method of our redemption as well. He chose the method of his passion. He didn't have to come and suffer and die on a cross. He could have created another way. He's God. But in his ultimate wisdom and his ultimate love for his people, he decided uh, to endure the most excruciating death and punishment that anyone could ever bear. No one could ever bear it. Only the son could bear the punishment from the father. And, and, and Jesus satisfied every ounce of judgment, uh, every ounce of condemnation that we deserved. And that's the reason for the talk of sin and judgment and justice, because that's what the cross is about. Uh, and we're not to mention sin, judgment, and justice uh, when we preach after those are the primary reasons that Jesus came to die. You see, the preacher is never to compromise his message on the account of turning people off or turning people away. We could look at the modern church and see where that sort of conduct can lead to. When we go out into the public square and people are addressing uh, the fact that we are being judgmental, uh, they're, they're hypocrites because that's exactly what they're doing when they're saying that we're uh, being judgmental. So we all make judgments. Uh, what's important here is whether or not the judgments are of God or the judgments are of our own. Uh, and obviously if we're defaulting to what the scripture teaches, we go out and we address the fact that God says that this is wrong. It's not what I say, it's what God says is wrong, and I'm just telling you what He has said. If we look at Scripture, we find that uh, the, the judgment passages, it teaches you how to judge. Not that you can't judge, it, the, the passages are talking about how we are to judge, and that you know we're not going to be in a particular type of sin and saying this is wrong while we're living in hypocrisy. So we want to make sure that we uh, understand what the, wor the Word of God is teaching here, and it's teaching us how to make proper judgments. Well, the Bible declares that God abhors that which is evil, um, and we should also abhor that which is evil. We shouldn't love the homosexual lifestyle. We should abhor it, and that's what compels us to speak truth in that particular area, just as much as we hate abortion or we hate evolution or we hate the lies that are being put forth that speak against the truth of God's Word. So we do hate evil, but we're compelled by the love of Jesus Christ to go out and declare the good news. Um, so if a person were to tell me that statement, ultimately they would be the one who is judging, and they would be the one with the plank in their eye, because they're being hypocrites themselves. And when, when, that, when that scripture, uh, if we look at that in the Bible, we see that that's what it's talking about. You know, pull the plank out of your own eye so you can see clear enough to be able to help your brother pull the plank out of his eye. Um, but if we read the, read the book of Corinthians, it talks about, to, in, in the book of John as well, to judge spiritually. We should be able to judge. Uh, we, we should use the scriptures as a, as a form of judgment. I'm not talking about hypocrisy or um, condemning somebody um, unlawfully. I'm saying that we must be able to judge spiritually. The Bible says so. The street preacher, even if he is loving, filled with the Spirit, and preaching the truth, he's going to come under those types of criticisms. Nobody cares what he's saying, nobody's listening, and if they are listening, he's just making them mad. But we know that in Isaiah chapter 55, God himself says, my word will not return to me void or empty, but will accomplish the purpose for which I send it. 
So we have that confidence that God's word is going to accomplish his purpose. In fact, I remember open air preaching on a ferry that was going from Staten Island to New York. And uh, a good friend of mine went and, and preached the gospel message. And then, you know, I was uh, praying while he was preaching. I get up to go ahead and, and start to preach. And, and, and I shared my testimony. I went over Isaiah 53 and some other messianic prophecies. I shared the gospel message. And as I was doing it, every single person had their head down. They wouldn't look at me for one second. They looked like they were doing all different kinds of things, not paying attention to me. And after I was done, after about seven or eight minutes, uh, the, the, the fellow that I was with said, as, as the ferry settled into New York, listen, anyone here who uh, wants to have a Bible, just let me know, because we've got a supply of Bibles here that we'd like to give out. Now, there were about 35 people there, and I was sure not one of them was going to take a Bible. But when we were done, about 25 Bibles were handed out to people. I couldn't believe when they, they got online to, to, to ask for the Bible. So you never know how God's Word is impacting somebody. You just got to be faithful to God and get the Word out. The average person will look at a street preacher um, who, standing on the corner, seems to be reaching absolutely no one. Uh, as he preaches, people just walk by. Um, no one even looks at him. No one even bats an eyelash. Uh, and you say, he's wasting his time. Ah, and I say, you err because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. You see, this objection comes from a misconception of what gospel preaching really is. Uh, and most people, and Christians too, when they think of gospel preaching, uh, they think about just saving people, getting people saved. Uh, in scripture, we see much more. We see gospel preaching uh, saving people, of course, uh, but we also see it hardening people. Uh, convicting, uh, discipling people, anointing people, encouraging people. So the preacher standing on the corner who looks like he's wasting his time because he doesn't have, let's say, a big gigantic crowd around him with their Bibles open is actually being obedient uh, and in effect doing much more uh, than we ever may see or know. The preacher uh, who's, who seems to be reaching no one is doing exactly what God wants him to do. Be obedient and preach the gospel. He knows he's called. Uh, he knows that he has a message to preach, and that's why he's there. Uh, the biblical street preacher at this point says, end of story. I have a mission, uh, and regardless of who listens or who objects to it, I'm going to preach. I mean, no, this guy's just so harsh and unloving. The Bible says that, that God is love, and I don't get how him being everyone's faces is doing that, you know? Uh, going to the streets is a litmus test. Uh, uh, what is my heart like? How can I see thousands, millions of people perish and, and not go to them? We must. We must go to them because they're not going to come to us. Because, you know, when people say that, sometimes there's truth in that. You are condemning someone. You are speaking down on people in a harsh way. So we need to have a tenderness in our hearts. You know, Whitfield would weep over the people. Um, the people in the front row of his meetings, when he preached to 20 or, he preached to 20 or 30,000, tears would roll off his eyes and roll onto the crowd and spray them as he, as he is preaching and off his beard. And, you know, this is what we need. We need, we need tears for the lost. The uh, God is love, why are you preaching like that syndrome? Uh, it typically comes from a seeker-sensitive uh, modern church mentality. Uh, where things such as sin, hell, uh, the law of God, the justice of God, the holiness of God are rarely uh, taught or spoke about in detail. And don't get me wrong, the street preacher must never be harsh or show angry militant zeal. Uh, but if you look at the prophets and the apostles, uh, we see a variety of styles, uh, a variety of content and delivery in terms of preaching. Uh, but more importantly, for the most part, you see men who are literally weighed down and burdened with the sinfulness and the corrupted spiritual condition of the people that they were preaching to. Uh, and when the street preacher is at the feet of Christ on a daily basis, God will press on him this burden for souls. Uh, and that street preacher will be passionate. Uh, he'll be willing to risk everything to get that message across properly. Uh, to some, he may be accused uh, of being unloving and harsh, uh, but to those that are called, uh, to those that are, that are able to hear, it's going to be the greatest act of caring, compassionate love they've ever experienced.
You know, believe it or not, one of the best responses to this particular objection was offered by the famous magician Penn Jillette, who's also a well-known, outspoken atheist, and also, if you're familiar with some of the stuff he's done, incredibly blasphemous, no friend of Christianity at all. But he posted a video on YouTube where he talked about how Christians, if they really believed in a literal hell, uh, that they absolutely must do all that they can to radically warn people about it. That in fact, if they don't do things like shout their message from the housetops, he has no respect for them at all. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. We're here to tell people the truth about abortion before they make a decision that will You know, my wife and I spent the afternoon at an abortion clinic doing what we can to intercede for the babies that are being taken into these bloody concentration camps for execution. Now, if I really believe that this is what's happening, what should my response be? Stay at home, maybe pray a prayer or write a letter to the editor of my local paper? I mean, give me a break. Christians need to step up to the plate and act on their beliefs or stop pretending that they really believe them? Um, you know, I'd say we're a, a secular society publicly, but privately we're very, uh, you know, very religiously diverse. And I'd say like in the public arena, I feel like there needs to be a little separation of church and state. Like maybe it's not your right to, you know, force your religion down someone's throat in the public arena. Like people can't get away from it. I'd say that this is probably more appropriate if he wants to share his opinion with like-minded people at his church. Like if you want to believe that, that's fine, but don't, you know, don't shove it down our throat. So Christ preached in the open air, the apostles preached in the open air, uh, Christianity spread by means of open air preaching. Uh, and so we don't do it based on what the culture says. The preacher is like a messenger or a servant on a mission uh, from his king or from his master. And, and, and a messenger or a servant will deliver the message regardless if the recipient believes they need to hear it or not, or whether or not they want to receive the message, it still gets delivered. So a preacher must obey his master. That's Jesus Christ. And when someone complains and says, well, I'll go to church if I want to hear a sermon, you have no right to push this at me uh, in the public like this. That's like someone uh, without legs saying, well, if I want to get there, you know, I'll walk myself. You know, man is unable to come to God without a preacher, just like a maimed person is unable to walk without legs. You know, God commands us to preach the gospel publicly out of his love and grace. Uh, and mankind wants nothing to do with God in its natural state. He has no legs to walk to God. So... God, out of his love, sends preachers. Uh, and then once the sinner is saved, the complaint, uh, how dare you preach to me in a public place, turns into uh, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. It's no longer the day of street preaching. That in, in Wesley's time, and Whitfield's time, it, it was acceptable. In our time, not. You know, that's not true. Wesley and Whitfield, Daniel Rowlands, Hal Harris, they were mocked, they were laughed at, they were considered weird, strange, doing damage to the flock of God. Street preaching has always been a scandal. So we just need to accept that. It is a scandal. It is going to seem weird. It is going to seem strange. You know, when, when at the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God fell upon the apostles, who can deny that that was God? And yet it was said of them, they're drunk. And then Paul in, in, in Acts 17 is called a babbler, you see. And so we shouldn't let these things bother us. I thought being Christian meant to love one another, and I just can't see Jesus doing something like that over there. Our Lord did both. He, he went to the synagogue, uh, but he also went out uh, into the open air. 
but I think that his most effective ministry was in the open air because there was a hardness of heart among the religious people. Um, and so he went out and he met the needy. Um, a verse in Isaiah 42 tells us that he would not cry out, he would not shout in the street, which means that he wouldn't be a rabble rouser. He, he wasn't involved in civil unrest. And yet that passage also tells us a bruised reed shall he not break and a smoking flag shall he not quench. In other words, people who were bruised and almost broken and needing healing, uh, people whose embers of life and vitality were about to extinguish, those were the people the Lord Jesus wanted to reach. They weren't in the synagogue in the sense that the people in the synagogue thought they were well, mm -hmm. but it was the sick who needed the physician. So Jesus went to the the place where the sick people were. John chapter 7. And Jesus, in the middle of the Feast of the Tabernacles, that's actually the last day, Jesus stands up uninvited. They didn't invite him to preach. They didn't say, Jesus, come and give us a sermon. But he stood up and it says he cried aloud. And he says something like, if any man thirst, let him come to me. And I think that that's, it serves as a good example that Jesus Christ preached not just to those who wanted to hear him. Christ's example was that it, he, it wasn't secret, like a lot of the cults out there, everything's secret and private. But the gospel, whatever he did, he was out in their streets. He was teaching. He was up on the mountains. He was out in the sea, continually teaching openly and proclaiming the word of God, and so shall we. If we look at Jesus Christ's life, uh, that is where he went. He went out into the public square uh, to declare the truth. So we need to follow uh, in his footsteps. Jesus is preaching in the temple. And so we have this idea that, that that was the place where people preached. That was not the place where people preached. He wasn't really authorized by the Pharisees and the Sadducees to go in there. When he stood up, and the fact that he stood up, rather than sitting down as most teachers would teach, the fact that he stood up and preached that way, he was a street preacher. Yeah. He was going into territory where he really wasn't welcome. So we shouldn't think that by him going into the temple, it was like a pastor going into the church. And that right. I hear people say that all the time, yeah. and that's not true. Right. He was going into enemy territory. To be honest, it's kind of frustrating because I've got a friend here with me that I've been getting to know, want to share the gospel with him, and then we come across a guy like this who's just beating everybody over the head with it and uh, it kind of messes up you know, my opportunity with him, I feel. 1 Corinthians uh, one twenty one, where it talked about that the foolishness of preaching pleased God, that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. And, 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 and what's, so, what's so powerful about that statement is that it, it pleased God. You know, it pleased, it pleased God to go out and proclaim the gospel, God's means to save the lost. The people who have the most issues with open air preaching in my mind are sometimes Christians. When I open air preach, Christians come up to me and said, that's not the way you do it. You can't do it that way. You're offending people, you're turning people off, or, or even they'll say you're sending people to hell. And that's, that's a lie, it's not true. But you know, I'll say to those people, I'll say, well, you don't agree with what I'm doing here. Why don't you go ahead and you tell the right message. You share how it's supposed to be shared. And I'll ask them, what is the gospel then to you? And they'll share and um, they don't know the gospel. They don't know the fullness of the gospel. It's called patient evangelism when you're supposedly to take time, you know, set an appointment up with them or even invite them to a church. The problem with that is 150,000 people die every day and we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And you don't see that in the Bible. You know, the Bible says in Mark 16, 15, to go preach the gospel to every creature, proclaim the gospel. And today, the problem is with the church is they're filling the great omission, not the great commission. If it's a Christian that's coming forward and saying uh, that you're giving Christians a bad name, I would ask them, when Jesus went out into the public square and the disciples went out to declare the good news, uh, were they giving uh, Jesus a bad name? Or were, were the disciples giving Jesus a bad name when they went out into the public square? Uh, of course not. Uh, Jesus uh, and his disciples, and we f we're following simply in their footsteps. But the fact of the matter is, is that the gospel does confront and it does cause that situation, whether you're out there in the public square openly declaring his word or even in a discussion with someone. Uh, obviously, we want to be friendly in the way that we approach people, but at the same time, we can't 
uh, move away from what the Word of God teaches because it's not going to be taken well by the hearer. Not everyone is called to be a street preacher, and some people are called to do more friendship evangelism and everything else, and I praise God for them. They're not any less spiritual. They need to keep doing it, but they need to also realize there are some men, God has raised them up, fire burns in their bones, and they cannot be silent. They cannot be. Hi, my name is Pat Nicarado from Go Stand Speak Ministries, and on behalf of myself, the Apologetics Group, and Eric Holmberg. I want to thank you for watching this presentation of Go Stand and Speak, the forgotten power of the public proclamation of the gospel. I'd also like to share a word with you about what you should do next. The title of this film comes from Acts 5.20, where the apostles were miraculously released from prison by the angel of the Lord, and they were told to go stand and speak in the temple all the words of this life. In Acts 4.20, just one chapter before, the same apostles were told not to speak. And the response was, well, we cannot speak that which we have but seen and heard. The public proclamation of the gospel is much more than just getting up the nerve to stand on a street corner and preach. That's the end result. What must first happen is like the apostles in Acts chapter 4 and 5, street preaching must simply be an overflow of what you have seen and heard in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Go Stand and Speak is really about reformation. In order to bring true reformation to our families, our country, the government, and the nations throughout the world, it must not begin on the streets. It must first begin with the individual. You must be personally changed and impacted by the majesty and transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In order to be compelled to preach all the words of this life, we must first be committed to following and living by all the words of this life. The life being Christ, he must be our Lord, he must be our King. As we've seen in history, once this happens in the individual lives of the people, where they're committed to following and obeying the gospel, regardless of the culture, regardless of the society or the consequences, a natural outpouring of the public proclamation of the gospel occurs, not just in street preaching, but with reformation in every facet of life. There's never been a more perfect time than right now, so I encourage you, yes, go stand and speak, but first, be personally committed to live by the gospel in every area of life. And you, like the apostles in Acts 4 and 5, will be able to do nothing less then go stand and speak that which you've seen and heard, not just on the streets, but by proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom in all pursuits. Now, maybe you've been called a street preacher or you're a pastor that needs assistance in this area in any way. Please visit us at gostandspeak.com for more information. Also visit theapologeticsgroup.com for strategic tools and resources to equip you in all areas of the Christian life, theology, apologetics, and worldview training. Also, find out how you can host your very own Go Stand Speak event or attend one that's happening in your area or nearby city. Again, go to GoStandSpeak.com. I just want to thank you again and may King Jesus richly bless you as you plow forward in your labors, in your trials, in your persecutions, serving him to the end regardless of the consequences without turning back. For his kingdom, amen.